Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 8 this morning. Mark chapter 8. Or power on and make your way there on your device. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but somehow I'm blessed because I have really good eyesight. And um, it, it didn't happen with anybody else in my family. Both my sisters have glasses, my parents both wear glasses, my grandparents on both sides all wear glasses, and somehow I have nearly perfect vision. But that doesn't seem to help all the time um, because I can go into my house and open my fridge looking for the peanut butter and it isn't there. And I, I swear, I mean, I look really well and it's not there and my wife just has to push me out of the way and magically it appears there. That's a man. I'm a husband. That's always my excuse, you know, I'm a husband. But um, not only that, but sometimes I will walk into the house and my wife will say, so what do you think? <laughs> and that, uh, there's two things that are happening there. First of all, I have to guess what it is, and I have to get it right on the first time. And second of all, I have to like it, right? <laughs> Those are the two things. Now, I've been married for 16 years, so my wife has a lot more grace on me than she used to. But um, needless to say, you know, it, it doesn't matter how well I see. It seems like I always still can miss things. I don't know what it is about that, but I, I think it's, that's true for our spiritual journey as well. It's amazing to me how um, we can grow spiritually, we can learn all kinds of things, and, and sometimes we feel like we've reached that plateau where all of a sudden, oh, I get it, you know, this is it, this is the thing, maybe that missing piece or whatever, and you get to the top and you look out and there's more peaks to climb. You know, and it's, it's a never-ending process. I think that no matter how far we get, in this life, it will only just be that tip of the iceberg of everything that could be known, every spiritual truth, the depths of the riches of God that Paul tells us are past finding out. How unsearchable are his riches. His, yeah, his riches. How unsearchable are his riches and his ways past finding out. Um, you know, Paul, of course, tells us this, and I think that it shouldn't be of any surprise to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which we all know because that's that love chapter. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, um, Paul tells us, hey, we, right now we see through that glass darkly. But then, when we're face-to-face, -face, and we're going to see face-to-face, -face, we'll know even as we are known. Um, and I'm convinced as long as I'm on this earth, there's going to be moments of, aha, I get it now, or, you know, revelation, but then there's also going to be those times when, when we just make mistakes, but we don't get it, when we miss something, it's like, I missed that day in church, you know, <laughs> when they learned that um, type of a thing, and I, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why we continue to gather together, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord as we just go through verse by verse, it just helps us to see the next thing, to see Jesus for who he is, and <clears throat> um, that's what we're going to see in our text today, and I think it's illustrated um, first by Jesus, and then it's going to be kind of played out in real time by the apostles right after um, he, he does this um, miraculous work. But I think, you know, this is unique, and in a sense, in chapter 8, because he does something different. And so let's take a look at that. In, in Mark chapter 8, verse 22, he starts out, Then he came, Jesus, came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands on him and asked him if he, if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. And then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Now Jesus and his disciples went out, of the towns of, um, out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. 
And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And when he called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save him. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of his Father, with all the holy angels. So, um, we see Jesus now, he's, he's operating within... Um, the Galilee region still, and Jesus has been going from town to town in the region of Galilee. And this is the northern area of Israel. You know, if you look at Israel today on the map, you'll see um, down where Jerusalem is was Judea, and then north of that um, is um, where the area of Galilee is. And then um, north of that even farther is Caesarea Philippi, which is where Jesus and his disciples were headed um, up towards the area um, that was original, or that was um, that Dan had taken. Actually, it became the area of the, the tribe of Dan. But Jesus has been going from place to place, and he's been healing people. Right? He's been touching people, um, casting out demons, healing the sick, opening the eyes um, of the blind. Well, he hasn't done that yet, but he's about to. And, and he's been, um, you know, opening the ears of those who are deaf. And just miraculous things, and his disciples have been seeing this. And I think probably as we gone through this together, at times maybe we've been frustrated at the disciples with Jesus. You know, we, we look at the dumb things that they say and they do, and, and you're thinking to yourself, how can they not get this? How can they not understand after all the things that Jesus has done? I mean, for instance, he, he fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and some fish, and, and then turns around and they, he feeds 4,000 people with loaves and fish, and, and they still don't believe because when they get in the boat and they just have one loaf they think Jesus is mad at them for not bringing bread. And this is what he says to them, specifically in that passage, just verse 18, if you look in Mark chapter 8 there. He says this, Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And, and do you not remember? And so he's specifically talking to them about their ability to hear, their ability to see, their ability to remember um, the things that they'd already experienced it, it, that, that should give them spiritual eyesight and spiritual hearing. But somehow, they cont continue to miss these miracles and what their significance is and what it means to them and who Jesus is and all these things that will matter so much. And so as much as this miracle that we're going to look at today is legitimate, as much as it shows Jesus' compassion and mercy, um, I think that there's a greater purpose to teach his disciples through this specific healing um, that he performs to show them something. It's an illustration, if you will, I think. Now, we've also been looking at the authentic Jesus and who is Jesus really? You know, all the things that people say about Jesus and who he is and all the things that the Bible says about Jesus and who he is. And, and who is the true Jesus? And so we're going to see several things. I think this is a great chapter for the authentic Jesus because um, who Jesus is is really important. And that's one of the questions brought up in this passage. Who was Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? And why does that matter to us? And then we, we find out that Peter actually got it right when he, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? Jesus got it right. But he also, even though he got it right, he held a view of Jesus that was incorrect. Didn't he? And Jesus ends up rebuking him for it. And so um, we find out that Jesus, even though we may know who he is, and we may have the right idea of what he was and who he is, we may have the very wrong idea about what he's about. And that's, that was true definitely in this passage. And then um, what he's about, you know, that's the last point, is the authentic Jesus was a savior who was born into this world specifically to die, to deal with the sin problem and then to rise from the dead. And that's what 
we're going to look at as we look at this today. So starting in verse 22, we see first this miracle. It says, then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought, to, and they brought a man to him and begged him to touch him. So very similar to other accounts that we've seen in the Gospels. Um, the people have this friend or whatever who's blind or deaf or whatever, and they demon possessed, whatever it might be, and they bring him to Jesus, and they, and they ask him, almost every time, they ask him the same thing. Will you touch him and heal him? And Jesus, of course, every miracle that he's performed that we've seen throughout the Gospels, everything he does, every time he heals somebody who's blind, he does it in a different way. Every time he heals somebody who's deaf, he does it in a different way. Every time he heals a lame person, he does it in a different way. Every time he does it differently. And this one actually is unique in all of the healings that Jesus does. It's different than all of them in a very strange way. In fact, in a, in a troubling way, actually. But I think, um, as I said before, that the Holy Spirit is trying to illustrate something to us that's beyond the obvious. And I'm going to point those insights out as we go along. So, it starts off pretty typical. They bring the guy to Jesus. And then it says, verse 23, He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit in his eyes, he put his hands on him and asked him if he saw anything. Very interesting. Chapter 7, he did something similar. Um, they brought a blind or a deaf man to him, deaf, and had an impediment in his speech. They said, will you put your hands on him and heal him? Jesus pulled him aside. This guy, he removes him from the town. Actually, they get, takes him and takes him completely out of the town. Why did Jesus take him out of the town? It's a good question. Perhaps, and I don't know for sure, but perhaps it was because of what Jesus said earlier about this town in Matthew chapter 11. Um, now, in Matthew chapter 11, of course, this is right before the feeding of the 5,000, so we know it happens chronologically long before this event. And so, um, back in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, it says, He began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works have been done, because they did not repent. So he says, Woe to you, Chorazan! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So, whatever the case, Jesus leads this guy out of town. And he leads him blindly. The guy has no idea where he's going. He's just following Jesus, maybe holding his hand or whatever. He's going out of town. He can't see anything. And he doesn't know where he's going. I don't know if you've ever felt like God led you that way. You know, pulls you blindly somewhere where you don't know what the implications are going to be of where God is leading or what God's telling you to do, but you're just, you just kind of go. You don't have all, you don't have the full picture. You guys ever feel like that? All I know is the next step that God's given me. I don't know what, what step B is. You know, I know step A. I don't know step B. And so I do step A, and then I wait to see what step B is going to be. I know that, you know, coming out here to start a church was kind of a big step for me, you know. But that's all I knew God wanted me to do, start a church. So we started a church. I had no idea what step B was going to be. Step B was the difficult one. Now, if God would have said, okay, you're going to go start a church, and this is what step B is going to be, I would have said, um, find somebody else. <laughs> but then step C was good, right? You know, I mean, it's just amazing how God just, uh, he works things out. And, and looking back on the whole thing, I see how every step was necessary. Every step, every part of it, and, and if he wouldn't have led us through the difficult times and into the good times and then back into the difficult times and back into the good times and, and to learn those things and to become uh, more mature, I'm not going to say mature, but more mature, <laughs> if we wouldn't have had every step, it wouldn't have been as good. It wouldn't have been um, his whole plan. And so this guy, he leads him blindly out there. He doesn't know what Jesus is going to do. He's asked to heal him, but he's not doing that yet. He's taking him out in the middle of nowhere and then he he ends up healing him which is beautiful but not in a, a normal way now one thing I want you to notice about this too he leads him out of a place it's not only that he let him out but it's also he let him out of a place that was known to be corrupt that Jesus had cursed and it was a place known for unbelief you guys ever remember being led out of a place like that? I mean, maybe we were in the world, you know, living for the things of the world, and Jesus takes us by the hand and says, I want to take you out of that. I want to take you to something better. 
And so Jesus pulls him out of that place, and he does that. He leads us by his spirit, and then Jesus heals him, and it's beautiful. Isn't it? Amen. He spits in his eye. <laughs> I don't know how beautiful that is. You know? I mean, the guy's out there. He can't see anything. All he hears is... <laughs> I mean, whoa. And then all of a sudden, what? What? <laughs> you know, what are you doing? Now, this is so bizarre. Because every I was looking it up, you know, is there anything in the Bible about spitting in somebody's eye? The only thing I can find is that in the Old Testament, every time somebody spit in somebody's face, and it's still today, that holds true today, it's not a very <laughs> polite thing to do. In fact, it's, it's an insult, isn't it? It's an insult. And I don't know if you ever found yourself in that position where God is leading you somewhere, and you're like, what? What are you doing, God? Why are you, why are you letting me out here? You know, just like the children of Israel, you know, they go out, they're at the edge of the Red Sea, and they say, did you lead us out here to kill us? Wasn't there enough graves in Egypt? Why would you lead us out here to die in the wilderness? And we do that. We feel like God has spit in our eye. You know, I, I know I deserve this because I'm a sinful person. Why, you know, why, why didn't you just kill me and not just drag me through all this and make me think you love me and then, then spit in my face? Whoa. How often we think that, you know, God's plan isn't quite as sanitary as we hoped it would be, or smooth as we hoped it would be. This guy, um, Jesus spits right in his eye, and, and I, I looked at this and looked at this and I looked at this and I thought, you know, maybe he spit on his fingers and then touched his eye, but no, it says specifically that he spit in his eyes and then touched him. Interesting. I've noticed that Jesus doesn't usually do things the way that I ask him to. I have to find myself saying, you know, Lord, what are you doing? Much like this guy probably said. <coughs> Again, you know, tenderness, I don't know, maybe, <coughs> I don't know, I, I think probably the only person you can get away with spitting in their face is who? Your child, right? <laughs> Trying to get the dirt off. <laughs> you know, that's the only person you can spit. You know, and, and honestly, if your parent spits on your face, you can be like, oh, gross, you know, but at least you look presentable, right? They fixed something that was wrong with you. That's what Jesus is doing. He's fixing something that is wrong with this man. He spits in his eye. Then he touches him. And this is where it gets weird. This is where it's just so bizarre. He, he asks him, do you see anything? And this is unusual. He says, it, he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Now, actually, somebody in the first service mentioned this to me. I, I thought this was a great insight. That the first thing he did was he looked at men. He looks at men. Now, you understand why I have this strange background. What in the world does that mean? These trees. These people actually spent... 20 years shaping these trees with wires to get them to look like that. They have a whole garden full of people, you know, walking, they have chairs and stuff they've shaped into trees. And they did all that just so that we can have this today. Isn't that nice of them? Anyway, but he says, I see men like trees walking, so he couldn't see perfectly yet. And he's looking at, he's just looking at men. He says, I just see these men that look like trees walking. This is the only time that Jesus has ever healed somebody and they weren't immediately healed. Isn't that odd? I mean, did, you, did Jesus make a mistake? Didn't he get enough, you get enough oil, you know, healing juice, and you know, rub it in the guy's eyes or something? Did he not get enough? No, of course he got enough. This is, Jesus intended all of this. Did Jesus even need to touch the guy or spit on the guy or anything to heal him? No, he could have touched him, he could have a hundred miles away, he could have said, yeah, that guy is healed now. And he would have been healed, like we saw in previous passages. He didn't have to do any of this, and yet he does it all for a reason. He does it all for a reason. <clears throat> and he just had to go back for a second lick, I guess. But there's a reason for the progressive healing. Verse 25, notice this. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. So this time, 
Jesus makes him look up. And I, I suppose looking up to heaven. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. So this is the first time Jesus didn't heal on the first try. And yet I think in our own experience we kind of notice that too. How many of you guys got saved and thought, this is it, I'm never going to sin again? <laughs> oh, so wonderful. I'm saved now. Oh, I'm forgiven. Oh, it's, it's done. And like 10 seconds later, <laughs> you're like, oh, maybe it didn't stick. You know? <laughs> I need to do that again. You know, it didn't work. And yet you notice that in your life. How many of you notice that you, you go through this process of sanctification? And I'm not there yet, although I'm a lot farther along than the day I got saved. Now maybe the Lord did something for you miraculously. I remember when I first got saved, the first thing the Lord did for me, well, a couple days later, I remember the Lord started putting all this conviction on my heart. I needed to get away from some of the influence I was around. And so I remember calling um, my dad and saying, hey, God, I need you to come get me um, in Idaho. He was traveling and going to churches all over the United States, and I want to go with you. He'd offered to take me before, but I wasn't really into it until I got saved, and I was like, i got to go. So I called him, and he says, yeah, I'll come pick you up. And I remember hanging up the phone and thinking, oh, no, I'm going to say the F word in church. There's just no way around it. I mean, that's just my vocabulary. It's just the way that I spoke. I mean, I grew up with that, and that's just, I had a hard time containing myself. Even at work, in front of my friend's parents, I would say the F word all the time. And people, my, my friends were like, dude, don't say that from at home. Like, I say it at home, you know, I'm just, there's just no filter on this thing. What am I going to do? And from the moment I hung up that phone, the Lord just took that away. I don't know, maybe you experienced something like that where the Lord just took something from you. Some sin in your life is just gone. And there's a lot of other things I can think about that I wish the Lord would have taken too, but he didn't. It's almost like he's saying to me, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. You know, you're going to struggle with those things because they keep you coming back to me. But this thing is necessary. I take this right now. It's necessary. I remove this from your life. Does that mean I never said the F word again? Pretty much. There was this one time. I remember I was driving with my wife in the car. It was uh, after we were first married. We were heading to Calvary, Boise. We were getting ready to teach the children. <laughs> there was no parking spot. I started arguing with her, she started arguing with me. I said something to her, she didn't like the way it sounded, and so she started to mock me. <laughs> and I told her to shut the up. <laughs> and uh, she got the picture. Um, but it was, a, it was a low moment for me as your pastor. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm going to have low moments, that's the problem with this. I'm going to have low moments, I'm going to make mistakes, I'm still going to fail every once in a while. You know, inexcusable. I'm not trying to justify that type of language, right? <clears throat> but, but, you know, the Lord, he's working on us. And, and this guy, you know, <coughs> he healed, but not completely. And then he touches him again, he's healed completely. And I, I think, that, you know, as we think about our own life, we know that Jesus is taking us through this process. You know, he sees us as perfect, but he's still sanctifying us. He's still working at us. Um, day by day. And then, this is interesting too, notice, it says verse 26, and he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. So Jesus sends him to his house, but not into the town. I think this is interesting because it, it tells us that Jesus knows where this guy lives. He knows he doesn't live in town. Go back to your house, but don't go to the town. You know, and I think that it's important to realize is Jesus knows where you live too. He knows everything about you. And yet he still wants to heal you. He still wants to bless your life. I guess it could be that he didn't want to go into town because he'd already pronounced that word <coughs> on Bethsaida and Corazon. Or it could be because this guy doesn't have the whole story yet. He doesn't realize all the implications of why Jesus healed him or what that healing means just yet. And I think that that's probably the case, so we're going to see that a little bit later. Let's look at verse 27. It says, Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. 
And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So now they're traveling again north um, toward the area of Dan. And he, he, he busts out with a really important question. What are people saying about me? What, what do people say about me and who I am? And their answers are interesting because I think that they're pretty typical. They, they say this, um, so they answer, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And order, this is the common bias. What they're saying is, yeah, you know, people are saying you're a good teacher. You're, you're maybe an ascended master or a miracle worker, a messenger from God. Now, are any of those bad things? No, they're good things. I mean, great things. I mean, it, it, they don't have a low opinion of Jesus. They don't say, oh, they think you're a deceiver. They think you're a charlatan. They think you're a, a whack job, right? No, they say, well, they think you're John the Baptist. They think you're a prophet or Elijah come back, which are good things. But notice they're good things, but they're not the Son of God. They're not God in the flesh. They're not saying that about him. And so even though they hold a high opinion of him, their idea of who he is is very wrong. And you notice that within the cults. You realize that Hindus, that Buddhists, that um, even, even Muslims believe in Jesus. And they, they hold him in high esteem. The Buddhists would say, oh, he, he's an enlightened one. He's one who understands the cosmos, you know, the universe. And he, he was, you know, ascended, you know, in a way. And the Hindus would say, oh, he's an ascended master. He's, you know, one of those enlightened masters. He, he understood things that everybody else didn't understand. And then, of course, Islam, they say, oh, he's a prophet. You know, Jesus was the last great prophet before Muhammad. But one thing that they won't say about him is that he is the son of God. And they definitely won't say that he's God. Now, the cults have done the same thing, except they relegated him just to being the Son of God, except removed his deity, and they say he's not God. He's the Son of God, but he's not God. And, and, and I think that's pretty, a pretty important thing, um, you know, to understand who Jesus was, because um, what does the Bible say? Does the Bible say that he was God, or does it not? And I think that that's what the big question is. What does the Bible say about Jesus? I want to look at a few passages that talk about this. First of all, let's look at John 1.1. 1, 1. I think we'll put it up on the screen, um, but if you want to turn to it, you can. John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, some people, specifically our Jehovah's Witness friends, will say, well, what this is really saying is that there's an article missing, and it reads, actually, in the beginning was the Word, the Word... Um, was with God, and the Word was a God. And even though Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that there's more than one God, they say that that's what it means that Jesus is some sort of a demigod. Um, not really God. But the problem with that is, I was sitting with Jehovah's Witness one time, we looked it up in the Greek, and actually the way this reads, you, you'll find it interesting. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. Not... The word was God. And so if there is an article in there, then it would read, God was a word, not the word was a God. And so they have a problem. What this is saying is that Jesus is God. <clears throat> now, it didn't say it was Jesus yet, but it says, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. So He is the creator of everything, right? That's what this word is. And then verse 14 is the clincher. And the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so there it ties it to Jesus saying that the word, and actually the word dwelt there in the Greek is the word tabernacle. You remember the tabernacle in the wilderness that went around um, with the children of Israel? You're saying Jesus was you know, the manifestation of God's presence, and that's what that was in the wilderness, but he's the physical personage manifestation of God's presence that is with us. Pretty amazing. To go further into that same concept, look at excuse me, look at uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Now, of course, this was the proclamation 
Do we have that verse? No. Matthew 1, oh, we don't have that one. Okay, this is a proclamation of the angel to um, Mary and Joseph. In, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive, shall, excuse me, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, this is an important one. It says that his name will be Emmanuel, right? But they named him Jesus. Isn't that a problem? Not really, because the word name in the Greek can mean surname and mean what, what somebody's called, but it also very much means his authority. And so if we look at that in this passage, it says his authority shall be that he is what? God with us. That's, who his, that's his authority. <coughs> now beyond that, and that actually makes more sense when we look at Isaiah verse nine, or chapter 9, verse 6. We have that one? Um, yeah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now some people have a problem with the Everlasting Father. And they ask, is Jesus the Father? The answer is no. That, that word actually means the or originator. So he is, the, it, what you could translate that, the father of eternity is what that means. He is the one who created eternity. Jesus is the originator of eternity. So he is the mighty God, the everlasting father, father of eternity, prince of peace. That's his authority. So he's God with us. He is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But then if you, if you look at John chapter 3, and you, you know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. It goes on to say, for God, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And this is the important verse, verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already, for he has not believed in the name, the authority of the only begotten Son of God. And so who Jesus is, according to John 3, 16 through 18, is absolutely essential to our salvation. Very important to believe Jesus is who he said he was, or who the Bible says he was. But Jesus then, in verse 29, Mark 8, 29, <clears throat> he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Now, Matthew gives us a little bit more detail. Matthew's a longer gospel and adds more detail. And um, tells us the same story, but just gives different and more details in different places. Um, and in verse 16, uh, of chapter 16, it, it says, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he says, You're the Son of God. And Jesus answered and said, And blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. He's saying, Peter, A plus, you nailed it. You're blessed. And, and, and don't get a big head, Peter, because Peter was always the first one to talk, right? Whether it was right or wrong, he always was the first one to open his mouth. When any question was answered, you know, everybody else raised their hand and Peter blurted out, right? And, and so Peter gets this one right, and Jesus says, blessed are you, but don't get too excited because it's not you, it's not flesh and blood, it's my Father who's revealed this to you. you, you when you know this, you're enlightened because the Father has done this in you. And yet, something really interesting, same thing that he said to the blind man, and I don't think it's any coincidence. It says, verse 30, he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. Wait a minute. Isn't this front page news? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He's come into the world. Isn't this, I mean, this is Merry Christmas stuff, right? For unto us a child is born. You know, hallelujah. Peace on earth, goodwill towards man. The Savior has come into the world. Shouldn't this be on the front page of the Jerusalem Post? <laughs> Shouldn't this be like the biggest thing ever? And Jesus says, don't share it with anyone. Why? Because it's not the message. This is not the message. That Jesus has come into the world, 
there's a baby in a manger, or even that Jesus has died upon the cross is not the message. What is the message? See, Peter thought he had the message. Peter thought he got it. He's like, I got it. It's, it's there. It's, it's perfect. But Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Notice verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after the three days, rise again. And that is the message. You see, that if Peter would have gone out and proclaimed, the Messiah is coming to the world, Merry Christmas, or Jesus is on the cross, look, Jesus is on the cross, and Jesus is always on the cross, let's look at Jesus, he's on the cross, he would have missed the point, it would have been a false gospel. But it is not just that Jesus came into the world and not just that Jesus died on the cross, but Jesus has risen from the grave, conquering sin and death, and we, because of that, are set free. Amen. You see, it, it can't be the partial message. It can't be always going to Jesus in the manger, always going to Jesus on the cross, but it has to be Jesus risen and glorified and seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for you because He loves you. The gospel message it is like Isaiah said in, in Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Or 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is one of my favorite passages. It says, For he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That passage is mind-blowing. What's that saying? It's saying that you and me, any of us who have put our trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, are the manifestation of the righteousness of God. And that's a difficult one to handle, isn't it? That was a pastor who actually made a t-shirt that said, I am the righteousness of God. And then he had the verse reference on the back. I think it said, in him on the back, and then it said, the verse reference. And you know who was offended by that? Christians. Christians were offended by that. Why? Because we're unworthy. Yes, we are unworthy, but Jesus did it. And when God looks at us, he doesn't see your fil filthy, stinky, blind, deaf, ugly, whatever it is that you are. And I am, for sure but he only sees the perfect righteousness of his son when he looks at us. Because Jesus paid it all. When he died upon the cross and hung there, he said, it is finished. It is, it is done. The word, to telestai in the Greek, the word that's translated, it is finished, when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. That word actually means paid in full. It's the same thing that they would stamp upon somebody who, had, who completed their prison sentence. And in Rome, when you had committed a crime, maybe you stole something, they would say, this is what you have to do. You have to pay restitution. You have to go to jail. You have to do. And then once you had, you had com completed all of your restitution and done all of your time, then you could never be tried for that crime again. It was almost as if it was like you'd never done it. You, you basically you had a clean slate. You didn't have a rap sheet. You had a clean slate. And to prove it, they would give you a piece of paper, and once you were out of jail or whatever, they would take that piece of paper and they would stamp it with the word to die. It means paid in full. And that's what Jesus has done for you and for me. No longer anything for us to do other than to put our trust in him and to believe in him and allow his life to flow through us. I love it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, he says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. We were alienated from God, and he has brought reconciliation. He has brought us back into fellowship with himself through Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice that he made. And of course, John 3, 16. We already read that. But it's, it just lays it out so clearly. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What are we believing? Romans 10.9 tells us what we believe. Romans 10.9-11 it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus 
and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, that resurrection from the dead is so essential. You will be saved, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. It's our belief in him, in Jesus, that makes us righteous. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, for the scripture says whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. You see, Jesus did it all, and when we believe on him, that righteousness is accounted to us. And just for believing on him and confessing that, saying, yeah, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, you verbalize that. He says that's made into salvation, and then you'll never be put to shame. It's beautiful. It's, it's the gospel. It's the good news. And this is the news, Peter. This is what you need to understand. And so too it is for us. Jesus Christ crucified, risen from the dead. Not in a manger, not hanging on a cross, but resurrected and glorified. It's a whole package. A whole package of all that Jesus has done. All that Jesus has given us hope in. He did it all. Verse 32, he spoke this word openly. So basically he told all of them. You know, and other people that were standing around, he told everybody. The Son of Man is going to be rejected. He's going to be hated by the leaders. He's going to be mistreated. He's going to be killed. And he's going to rise from the dead. This was the message he was speaking. He spoke it openly. <laughs> then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So Peter's like, Jesus, hang on just a minute. Hey, guys, can you wait a second? Jesus, come over here. Lord, you know what? You're so negative. <laughs> All this talk about, you know, being hated by people, you know what? You don't have to be hated by people. I mean, we got a good thing going on. You need to heal people. And, and man, everybody's going to come around eventually. Stop this talk about death. I mean, come on. Come on. You know, this is, this is a golden age, man. You, you're, it's going to be good. I see what you're doing here, God. You don't need to do that. But Peter has the liberty, I guess because he's blessed now. He has the liberty to rebuke God. I don't know if you guys have ever felt that way. Liberty to review God. God, why are you doing this to me? Why did you spit in my eyes? What's going on here? I don't get it. I love it. You see, Jesus sees that Peter and everything that's about that Peter's about is all about himself because. Yeah, Jesus is going to be crucified and all that. That's great, Jesus, you're talking about this, but this doesn't really fit into my five-year plan, and I'm following you. And so if you think that that's your plan, and you think I want to be involved in that, you got a different thing coming. And I've seen so many people walk away from the Lord because their life didn't turn out the way that they expected it to once they started following Jesus. Because he doesn't promise health, wealth, and prosperity. He does promise trials and tribulation. Everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You can pull that one out of the you know, promise box. <laughs> and yet, you know what? The beautiful thing about it is, is even though we're, we have those, we have beautiful promises that go along with those things. And that is that even though we are persecuted, even though we have trouble in this life, that this life is not what it's about. And that in the midst of all the struggle and all the trial and all the problems that I'm going to go through in this life, I have a peace that passes understanding. I have love that he can put in me that, that's beyond comprehension. I have an abundant life that he has promised me that has nothing to do with the material, but has everything to do with my relationship with him. And if I'm partaking in all of those things, I have fullness of joy. That's what he gives us as his believer. As his believers. But, you know, Peter, his crucifixion, raising from the dead, didn't fit into Peter's plans for Jesus, so he maybe tells Jesus how he thinks it should go down. But Jesus has something to say to Peter, and not just um, to Peter. It says in verse 33, but when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, so he's rebuking Peter openly. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. I don't know, did Jesus, did Jesus know he's talking this way to the first pope? I mean, I mean, this is serious, right? <laughs> Peter didn't get it. He didn't have the full picture, nor would he have the full picture until he's baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? 
Now, Jesus wasn't implying that Peter was saying. He wasn't saying Peter was saying. And he wasn't saying that Peter was possessed by saying. Now, no doubt Peter was listening to the suggestions of saying. <coughs> Or maybe just to the suggestions of his own flesh. But what I think is interesting here is you remember that these are the same implications that Satan was giving in his temptation. Remember when Jesus was in the wilderness, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Satan comes to him to tempt him, you know, which says, hey, you can make the stone into bread. But then the second thing he does is he says, it says he took him to a high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in an instant. He says, if you bow down and worship me, you can have all these things. In other words, Jesus, you don't have to die on the cross. You don't have to go that route. There's an easier way. All you have to do is just bow down and worship. You don't even have to mean it. Just do it. He didn't say that, but he says you can have everything. And Jesus said you shall not put your Lord, the Lord your God to the test. He rebuked Satan. Actually said... Um, you shall serve the Lord your God and Him only. Or, you know, worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. That's what he said. And, and if to illustrate this further, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when He is there anticipating the suffering that He's about to take place, um, and, and, and all the separation from the Father and all those things, I mean, it was so stressful, that just the thought of being separated from the Father, having the world of sin laid upon his shoulders that Jesus begins to pray and I think for our benefit he prays if there is any other way let this cup pass from me yet not my will your will be done and we look at that and we think was Jesus having second thoughts I don't know what Jesus was thinking or what he was going through there but one thing I do know is that if there was any other way the father would have answered that prayer differently and yet Jesus went to the cross and died, which tells us very clearly there was no other way. It was the only way. And Jesus did it for us. It was the only way for us to be saved. So he rebukes Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but you're mindful of the things of men. You still have your eyes on men. Remember that? That's what the problem was with the guy that was blind. When he opened his eyes, the first thing he saw was men, right? Walking around like trees. And then Jesus put his gaze upward. He, Jesus moved his head up, and then he saw clearly. And I think that's what has to happen to us, isn't it? We get saved and we think, oh, this is great, I'm saved now, things are going to be wonderful. And we start to think about how wonderful our life here is going to be. And Jesus has to say, no, this isn't, this isn't what it's supposed to be like. And he puts our gaze upward to him and he says, this is what I want you to gaze at. At the Father, at his plan, set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. This is what Paul would tell us in Colossians 3. So Jesus, in a sense, spits on his finger again and rubs it one more time into Peter's eyes. And, and everyone, verse 34, notice this. He says, when he, came, he called all the people to himself, so now he's saying, okay, everybody come over here. Let's talk about this. With his disciples also, he said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So don't look at things, the things of men. You know, this is what Peter was just doing. Don't look at the things of men. But you have to deny yourself, take it across and follow me, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Again, it's God's plan, not my plan. God's way, not my way. Now there's a big difference, I know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, self-denial that happens. You know, we all are taking self-denial one way or another, right? Maybe it's that new diet you just went on now that Thanksgiving's over. Maybe you're waiting until after Christmas. But you're going to deny yourself some sweet things that maybe you indulge yourself on Thanksgiving. And there's self-denial there, right? And you're denying. Or maybe it's a, a type of self-discipline where you're going to, you know, be into martial arts or something like that. And you're going to train your mind to think, you know, whatever, to, to be disciplined and self-will and all that. Or maybe it's a financial thing. You know, we've got to start making some better financial decisions, and so we're going to start getting on track financially. And, and we, deny, we deny ourselves a lot of things when, when we do those things, but what are they for? They're for self. Yeah. 
I'm uh, losing weight so that I look good in that, you know, that speedo. Oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking now everybody's picturing me in a Speedo. <laughs> that would be a bad thing. Um, but they're all for self, and yet you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and the cross was an instrument of death. You know, he's not talking about you got to wear a cross and let everybody know you're a Christian because you have this cross around your neck. In their day and age, if you were to bear your cross, that means I'm going to my death. And he's saying you have to deny yourself. It means to, to forget about yourself. To say, I'm not important. You know, God's important. Other things are important, not me. That's a very difficult thing. And yet, honestly, you know what's, what's amazing about it? It is, it is the path to fulfillment in life. You know, thinking I have to, you know, Get everything I want. You know, how, how does that work out for people? You have everything you ever wanted. You know, that's the, the Chinese curse, right? May you get all that you want. And may you live in interesting times. You know, that's, it's a curse. How many people have been at the top and when they got everything they ever could have wanted, they killed themselves? Why? Because it's a curse to get everything you ever wanted. Because things don't satisfy. Life does not satisfy. The only thing that can satisfy is God. And you were created so that he's the only thing that satisfies. And so he says, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Die to self. And that's what we do when we come to Christ. It is we, we are crucified with him. That's what the Bible says. And so Paul said, he says, I am crucified with Christ, yet I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's saying this is to me, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain, Paul would say. You see, it's not about what I can get out of this life. It's about finding God. And I have noticed in my own life that the more I seek after God, and, you know, and I think we get this wrong idea that, okay, God's going to take me, he's going to make me wear itchy, scratchy sackcloth, and I have to go live in a monastery and deny everything. And people have taken it to that extreme. You know, self-mortification and all these crazy things that people do, monastic living. And yet, that's not what this is talking about. He's saying, follow me. Give it all to me. And I've noticed in my life that what happens when I follow, when I'm all in for God, all of a sudden, I enjoy my marriage. And I enjoy the things that God has brought into my life. And I have strength through the trials and tribulations. I don't have to freak out every time something goes wrong because I know God's in control. I know he loves me. It's such a different life. It's a, such a different way to live. And he's saying, this is the way I want you to live. To, to live like it says in Romans 12. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I, I think we read this and we're thinking, oh, I've got to die to self. And, oh, I've got to, oh, God wants to make me miserable. <laughs> no, he, he's like, Eat your vegetables and then you can enjoy dessert. <laughs> you know? Let go of it and experience the blessings. The satisfaction, the fulfillment that comes from knowing God and walking with God. Because nothing outside of that is going to fulfill you. Notice what he says. For what, what will it profit? Verse 36. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's an interesting question. I think a lot of people don't even think about that until they're faced with death. You know, you live for yourself and your entire life, and then you're faced with death, and you think, man, everything was worthless. Everything was meaningless. You know, I live for wealth, or I live for pleasure, or I live for fame, or, or gaining the world, and everything the world has to offer, worldly success. And what good is it now, now that I'm sitting in a nursing home? Now that I've lost everything. You know, you meet people like that. You go over to the, the rest home, you, you meet them. You meet them, people who've lost family, who've lost their house, lost their pets, lost their friends, lost their mind. Lost everything. 
We're all headed there. We're all going there. The question is, am I going to go in rich or am I going to go in poor? Because you'll also meet people there, people who love Jesus, who have not lost anything. And they are excited even more so now that everything has been stripped from me as I sit in this convalescent home to know that someday, very soon, I'm going to meet the prize that I've been waiting for my entire life. I'm going to see Jesus face to face. And everything I've worked for and everything that I have, have built in my life is finally going to pay off in the moment that I close my eyes and wake up in eternity. Because I possess God. And nobody can take it away from me, whether I'm in a nursing home, or whether I'm in a concentration camp, or whether it doesn't matter where I am, not life, nor death, nor angels, or principalities, nor powers, or things present, or things to come, can separate me from the love of Christ, which is in, or love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have the one thing that is worth possessing, and He is my all. And never, nobody can take me away. I love what Tozer talks about when he, he says, he talks about the children of Israel and how they all received these portions of land and it seemed like Levi was going to be left out because he had made some mistakes in his life. But then God turned things around and he made Levi richer than all of his brethren when he said this. He says, you are going to be my priest and I am going to be your portion. He became richer than everyone because God was his possession. And so too it is for you and for me. If we seek to gain our life, if we try to build our life, if we try to find something in this world that will satisfy, we are always going to come up empty. But if we accept Jesus and say, Jesus, I just want to follow you. He ends with this, verse 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words is in this adulterous and sinful generation of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed of when he comes in his glory, the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Remember what Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. See, the gospel is the message. The gospel is the thing that God has given us, not just that Jesus was born into the world, not just that he died on the cross, and you'll see that as you read through the Gospels, and you read, or excuse me, you read through Acts, and you read through your Epistles, that every time the Gospel is preached, the resurrection is prominent. They don't just say Jesus died on the cross for your sins. They say Jesus died on the cross, and he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death. Paul said, without the resurrection, we have, of all men are most pitiable. Because if, the res if there's no resurrection, then we have no hope. But because Jesus rose from the dead, we have hope. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. We have eternity. We have a future. We, we know that God's plan for us is beautiful. And it can start now. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, Jesus can take all of your sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west. He'll never remember it again. And he will put on you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you'll simply... Put your trust in Him and go all in. So I want to follow you. I want, I want your life. I don't want my own life. I want you to be my God. And I will be your son. I will be your daughter. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. For these illustrations. And maybe I took some liberty in all of that, Lord. But I don't know. It just seems so amazing the way that you just weave everything together. The way that you lead us to yourself. The way that you clarify things for us. That you would take our, our eyes, we're seeing men like trees or whatever, you spit on us in our face, and you've touched us, and we're not seeing clearly that yet. Lord, take our, our gaze and, and put it heavenward. That we wouldn't be focused on the things below, but the things above where you are seated at the right hand of God, and that our, our lives might be dedicated to you, and that you might be glorified through us. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, we stand with you.